Zach Bowen was tall, charismatic, and was able to charm people very well. He had a laid-back attitude and certainly left an impression on everyone that he met. He had grown up in California before moving to NOLA in New Orleans in the mid-1990s. Zach had married young to a woman named Lana Shupak, ten years his senior. They had had two children together, and to care for them better, Zach had decided to join the army for the benefits in May of 2000. Unfortunately for Zach, Lana decided that she was going to leave him not long after, and she took their kids with her, leaving Zach understandably lonely and devastated, left without his family and paying child support. He found odd jobs around the French Quarter after being generally discharged from the army. Little did people realise just how much the war had impacted Zach, leaving him with severe PTSD and desperately needing help that was never found. Also, despite earning a NATO medal and the Presidential Unit Citation for his service, plus his commanding officer's recommendation that he receive an honourable discharge, he was released with only a general discharge. That meant that while he qualified for VA benefits, he couldn't get GI Bill education benefits. This had left Zach very bitter. Zach Bowen was an active duty member of the military in Iraq and Kosovo pre-9-11, and immediately following the tragedy, he was traumatised by a fellow soldier's sudden death, as well as the death of a child who he befriended that was killed for conversing with American soldiers. If that wasn't enough, because of his ill-fitting military issue combat boots, he developed a severe and painful case of hammer toe, contributing to his disgruntled state of mind with the armour. He began to purposely fail his health and fitness tests so that he could go back home and be with his family and his ailing wife Lana, who had since been diagnosed with hepatitis C and was very ill. Zach was generally discharged, losing all health benefits, and went back to New Orleans, where his mind slowly failed him as he transitioned back to civilian life. Whilst working in a restaurant called The Spotted Cat in the French Quarter, a neighbourhood famous for being the oldest in New Orleans, it was here that he met his soon-to-be girlfriend, Adrian Hall, who went by the name Ada. Addy Hall had been a bartender at the Spotted Cat. Having lived a rough life in the northeast United States, she moved to New Orleans for a new and better life. She was an artist and self-proclaimed Puerto Rican, meaning someone who belongs to the French Quarter. Addy was a free-spirited, feisty-tempered, independent artist, poet and dancer with a large circle of friends. Zach was instantly attracted to her. Addie, however, was wary of relationships with men because of the sexual abuse she had experienced when she was young that led to a string of abusive relationships as an adult. As beautiful a soul as Addie was, she was somewhat troubled and desperately trying to find her muse, find inspiration and find herself. When Zach had first noticed Addie, he had tried to let it be known that he liked her Addie liked him back, but she was somewhat guarded. She liked to give him a hard time and play the mean girl as a way of flirting, just to see how much he could take. The pair did eventually begin dating, but it wasn't the fairy tale that it had the potential to be. They had fallen in love during Hurricane Katrina in August of 2005. Dating for weeks before Katrina came into view, Zach and Ada decided to stick out the Category 5 hurricane together at her apartment, instead of taking the advice to evacuate the area. Though Lana, Zach's ex-wife, asked him to evacuate with her and the children, he didn't want to leave. Addie invited Zach to wait out the storm with her in her apartment, an act that Lana described as immature and reckless. Being locked down together made the pair develop an inseparable bond. They became known as the ideal couple at the restaurant. Their customers knew and admired them both, 
Sack and Ada were even photographed for national magazines and newspapers in the wake of the devastating storm, being interviewed about their choice to stay in the sitter. Katrina had devastated much of the Gulf Coast states, yet somehow the French Quarter did not flood and they were spared. The area was without electricity and the flooding in surrounding areas kept their little community of people who hadn't evacuated, isolated and sheltered from the nightmare facing the outside world. No electricity meant no heating or air conditioning, no running water and limited resources. One might imagine that Zach and Ada would be miserable, yet somehow this only made their lives more exciting. They went from bar to bar gathering up alcohol before returning home and setting up their own makeshift bar right outside. There they served up drinks in exchange for food and water. They collected debris and lit fires in the street to cook by and stay warm at night. It was like an exciting urban camping trip. Their efforts gained much media attention and they were featured in several newspapers, including the New York Times. They were called the King and Queen of Hurricane Katrina. The couple in love before the tragedy now found themselves head over heels. This, unfortunately, would not last, and when reality set back in, the lights in the city turned back on, the stars disappeared, and the real clean-up began. Zack and Ada were forced back into a lifestyle that they weren't quite ready to experience again. Bills piled up, job schedules came back, responsibilities returned, and Ada just wanted Zack. She didn't want his life or responsibility of his children and ex-wife. The honeymoon period was over, and the physical and emotional pain of abuse was only mildly numbered by vast amounts of alcohol and drugs that they began to consume over the months to come. Addie had also hidden an ugly side. Suffering from bipolar disorder and irregularly taking the medication to treat her mental illness, this caused anger, uncontrolled outbursts. Many of Zack and Addie's friends remember the outrageous fights that they would get into. A tumultuous relationship from the start, fueled by drugs and alcohol, Zack and Ada were destined for destruction. Violent fights erupted and Zack and Ada began to drift apart. Their solution to reigniting their passion was to get a new apartment together and starting over from scratch. One day, they had walked down Rampart Street and come across a for rent sign. An apartment above the famed Voodoo Temple at the time was available immediately and with months worth of tips in their pockets, they made an offer right away and moved in. This would become the infamous apartment of 826 North Rampart Street. No sooner did they unpack but a few boxes, then Addie went to the landlord and asked that the lease be in her name and her name only. She had discovered that Zack was cheating on her and decided that this was the last straw. Considering her past with men, this was an end-all be-all situation and their relationship was over for good. The landlord wrote out a handwritten contract and asked that Addie sort it all out in hopes that they would get back together. Once Zack learned of this deception, he would become angry and inconsolable. He felt that once again he was being left alone and devastated, just like Lana had done to him. He wasn't prepared to go through this again. At around 1am, on Thursday, October the 5th, 2006, Zack strangled his girlfriend Addy Hall to death. In a drunken stupor, he fell asleep next to her corpse on the futon, committed necrophilia and got up the next day and went out to work. His co-workers remembered him acting out of sorts, wearing sunglasses and a hat and becoming very quiet. Over the next several days, Zack cut up Addie's body in the bathtub with a hacksaw and a knife and dispersed the pieces of her corpse into and on top of the stove for cooking, as well as in the refrigerator. He gave her a haircut and placed her head inside of a pot on the front of the stove, placed her small feet and hands inside of another pot on the back burner of the stove, her legs and arms in a roasting pan inside the oven, and finally her torso in a black 
plastic trash bag in the fridge to be dealt with later. Apparently, his intentions were to separate bone from flesh as a means to more easily handle the disposing of her body. Many at the time said that there was intentions of cannibalism, but the autopsy reports confirmed that there was no signs of this. Addy's friends and co-workers asked where she was when they saw or called Zack. He told them she had left and went back to North Carolina. Some were surprised as they knew how much she loved New Orleans and couldn't see her leaving, whilst others were not shocked, knowing how unpredictable Addy could be and her tendency to run away from situations that were out of her control. Little did they know that Zack knew exactly where Addy was and what he had done to her. On Tuesday evening of October the 17th, 2006, nearly two weeks after the murder and dismemberment of his girlfriend, Zack Bowen committed one more act of violence by jumping to his own death from the seventh floor of the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel. He left a handwritten note and his army dog tags inside of a plastic bag in his back pocket and the gate keys to Addy's apartment in his front pocket. At around 8.30pm, New Orleans police received a disturbing call from the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel. A man's body was on top of the roof of the parking garage. Upon arriving and seeing the severely mangled body, it was clear that the man had died on impact. Unsure as to whether they had a murder, a suicide or a tragic accident on their hands, the investigators began by searching the body for ID. In the man's back pocket they found a note reading, This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol to 826 North Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend Ada in the oven, on the stove and in the fridge along with full documentation on the both of us and a full signed confession from myself, Zach Bowen. Police rushed to the address, a small apartment above the Voodoo Spiritual Temple. Once inside, they were confronted by something out of a horror movie. Despite the warm October weather, the apartment was cold, the air conditioning set on 60 degrees, similar to that of a meat cooler. The walls were spray painted with haunting messages of regret and pain, such as I'm a failure and instructions to call Zack's ex-wife and tell her that he loved her. I got a phone call asking if this was Lana Bowen. Yes. He said, this is the coroner. Zack is dead and he killed Eddie. And I just didn't understand. One message on the wall directed them to the stove. There on the pot on one of the burners was a human head, burned beyond recognition. In another pot were hands and feet. Inside the oven, in a large roasting pan, were arms and legs, also burnt. Investigators noticed that there appeared to be seasoning on the limbs and on the counter next to the stove were cut up potatoes and carrots. Inside the refrigerator, in a large plastic bag, they found the torso. But as horrifying as these discoveries were, police would soon find even more disturbing evidence in Addy Hall's journal. In the eight-page confession letter written by Zach Bowen in Addy Hall's journal, he described in graphic detail what had happened next. I killed her at 1am, Thursday 5th of October, he wrote. I very calmly strangled her, it was quick. It was also revealed that Zack's body had been covered in cigarette burns. In his confession letter, he wrote that he had burned himself, once for each year he had been a failure. In his confession, he expressed a great deal of regret. I scared myself not only by the action of calmly strangling the woman I've loved, for one and a half years, but by my entire lack of remorse. I've known forever how horrible a person I am, ask anyone. The security cameras at the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel captured Zach Bowen approaching the terrace and looking over it several times. Finally, he downed a drink and then threw himself to his death. 
Less than a decade after the murder, a woman named Mary Voodoo Queen Milan leased the building on Rampart Street and set up shop as Bloody Mary Haunted Museum and Tour. For a fee, visitors are let in to Zach and Addie's apartment to view the very stove and fridge where Addie's remains were found. Reports are that the apartment is decorated like a cheap horror film, complete with fake blood splashes and a bride and groom set of Chucky dolls. It would be stupid to pretend that the couple weren't here, she said. Detractors are just jealous that they didn't think of this first.